it's uh, significant. For the first time in Bundestag, for the first time since the Second World War, German nationalism will have a political representation. And that's not a small thing. Um, uh, let's also remember that these results are sometimes a fluke. I mean, in this country, uh, your president won by distribution, not by the number of votes. In Poland, uh, we have a populist government who uh, uh, elected in parliament by a party that received 38% of the vote, which normally doesn't give you majority. Uh, it was the fact that two left-wing parties didn't make the threshold that gave them uh, the majority of seats in parliament. Uh, and, and of course, in France, it was also luck, but the other way. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's path to victory was a very narrow one, and, um, uh, and he provided the leadership, but was also very lucky. Um, leadership matters. I mean, there are leaders who trade on fear, and there are leaders who trade on hope. And what I think Emmanuel Macron is providing is the positive kind of leadership, uh, which is now being backed by spending uh, uh, real capital on real reforms to do with the uh, uh, French labor market, which, which establishes France's credentials uh, in Berlin, but also um, hopefully will restore France's uh, competitiveness. That creates the possibility that the Germans may agree to a more, to, to a more economic union, um, uh, paying in return for more elements of political union, which is France's agenda. Uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. I, I, uh, if we'd continued on the path we were on until two years ago, this could have been a Franco-German-Polish engine driving new areas of integration in Europe. I personally believe it is in Poland's vital national interest for, their, um, for Europe to develop a defense union and for Poland to be in it. Um, uh, but sadly, we, we have nationalists in power who harm the national interest, not for the first time. So around this time last year, there was, I think, a palpable sense of panic in European capitals, in Brussels, and in Washington uh, right after Brexit, with the presidential campaign in this country in full swing, uh, with uh, the repercussions of the Eurozone crisis and, and the refugee crisis of 2015 still going on. And, and now, it seems to me after the Dutch and French elections, and also after the German elections, there is a certain degree of complacency kicking in, if not uh, of hubris to some extent. Uh, you had European Commission's President Jean-Claude Juncker urging countries outside of the Eurozone to join the Euro. Uh, Macron's vision for, 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 for the EU, as presented yesterday, was uh, very lofty and, and somewhat poor on the, on the, on, on the specifics. Uh, but the big question that, that lingers uh, in my mind is whether Europe really is out of the woods yet, or whether the same sort of problems that were plaguing us in 2015 are, are still, still lurking around? Uh, clearly, it's no time for uh, hubris, but a little bit of celebration. You know, two years ago, when I debated Brexiteers in Britain, they were convinced that Britain is unshackling itself from a corpse. And after the debate, they would tell you, ah, it's, when we leave, it's going to collapse. Well, I see no, no signs of that. And of course, uh, between ideas about how to make Europe more functional and actually doing it um, is uh, a great uh, difficulty in spending the political capital and, and, and converting the people of Europe uh, to, to the vision. But at least we now have the possibility of it. Uh, European democracies are dysfunctional just like American democracies are dysfunctional and, and we need to fix them and we need to also restore the sense of fairness to, to capitalism. Because otherwise, we'll get leaders who will, f who will fix it uh, with much more, like people like Corbyn and others, with much bigger collateral damage. So how do we do that? Well, I agree with Juncker and Macron when they say that Europe needs to become more political. 
uh, you know, if the system whereby democratically elected leaders of governments fi agreeing stuff in Europe, if you think that's not democratic enough, then we need more democracy. Um, a directly elected uh, pan-European uh, list to the European Parliament, uh, perhaps uh, merging the position of the uh, head of uh, commission and head of uh, council and electing that person directly. Um, uh, we, we need to uh, uh, make European politics uh, more functional uh, because uh, at the core of the current malaise is um, people's, um, the European people's conviction that elites have lost control, that um, the, uh, uh, the external border of the EU was not properly um, guarded, uh, that the, the perimeter broke, um, and no single member state can fix that. We, we can only do it by, uh, um, it's, it's like asking a US state to fix the border. It's, I mean, even the federal state might have a problem as, we, as they are discovering, let alone a single state. Um, so there are now issues that, uh, that even the largest European states uh, cannot fix. Therefore, we need to act in concert. And we therefore need democratic ways of coordinating policy. Let's talk about Central Europe for, 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 for a moment. So, so um, what you describe is a, is, a, is a vision for Europe that's becoming more integrated politically. Um, and there is now a real risk that a number of countries in Central Europe will be left out of that by their own decision. That would have uh, implications for those countries that I don't think are fully appreciated yet in places such as Poland or, or Hungary or, or even the, the Czech Republic. Uh, what can be done to raise a sense of urgency in those places that, that there really is a vital decision that will be taken over the next years that will determine their place on the map well, of Europe. We need to do the opposite of what uh, British politicians have been doing over the last 30 years. Namely, instead of um, uh, uh, misleading uh, the public about what membership means and what, uh, what the choices are, um, politicians need to lead the debate about um, state of affairs. The, the problem in Europe is that we have a confederal system, whereas um, in terms of managing either the currency or the external border, that means that any one member breaking the rules can bring the whole edifice down. down. Um, and um, Central Europeans have to decide whether they want to be again in the waiting room of their own creation or whether they want to play a, 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 a part in a much bigger whole. You know, in a sense, it's a dilemma that parties in our part of the world have faced for um, uh, in the process of creating the political system. Namely, you know, do you have full control over small party with which you completely agree, or do you join a coalition where your influence is diluted, but you have a chance to, uh, uh, to win? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's an old dilemma. And, um, and politicians need to be more honest with, with, with their public. And, and of course, some of them are not. Um, some of them, uh, just like in East Germany, in Poland, for example, the fewer and in Britain, in fact, the fewer foreign residents in any district, the bigger the fear of, of outsiders. So the scope for nationalist uh, rabble-rousing is there. But it's, it's, it's up to the peoples in what proportions they, they buy that, uh, that rhetoric or the message of hope. And, you know, as we say... Um, it seems like over the past couple of years, they've been buying it more and more, at least in our part of the world. And if you are trying... Yes and no, because in Poland, for example, the populists didn't win on an anti-European ticket. Quite the contrary. They ran a very moderate pro-European campaign. And it's only when they gained power that they turned, turned around. So 
it's only in the second election that we'll really know. All right. Let's turn it to the audience, perhaps, for, for a question or two. Um, so please wait for the microphone. Uh, please identify yourselves. And ideally, please end your question with a question mark. Yes, please. My name's, oh. uh, my name's Austin, I'm a master student at the Elliott School. Um, my question is, concerning the AFD and the rise of German nationalism, is AFD's, what, 13% showing this election? Is that a result of, how much of that is a result of the German populace actually buying to the message of German nationalism? And how much of it was just simply a protest vote? People who um, just wanted to, like, um, go against the establishment, but could theoretically be won back by the CDU or the SPD? Thank you. I'm not sure there's a contradiction there. You know, in Poland, the populists uh, also attracted the protest vote. Um, it goes hand in hand. There was a breakdown of, 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 of those numbers uh, done after the election uh, th through a poll, and I think 60% of F AFD voters reported that they were voting primarily against all the other parties rather than for AFD. Um, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Kirchick with Brookings. There was a lot of concern about President Trump coming into office that he would be awful for Europe, that there'd be a, a Yalta II agreement with the Russians and he'd pull out of NATO and, and all this. I'm curious what your thoughts are nine months into the administration, or eight months, whatever it is. Well, he's learning. Um, you know, he learned that, um, that uh, NATO budgets are not actually NATO uh, uh, financial contributions. It's a different thing. Um, but I'm still concerned, I have to tell you, because um, the rhetoric over North Korea uh, is uh, very dangerous. I mean, President Trump has um, deprived himself of the, a, a classic instrument of diplomacy, which is to be able to escalate the ladder of, to go up the ladder of escalation. You know, when you have a tough message, you first allow your um, uh, lower level officials to air it. Then you go to, 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 to um, deputy minister level. And, uh, and you only use the head of state when things are really serious and when you're about to do something to give the other side the chance to change policy. When the head of state does all the uh, communica uh, communication, um, the other side might miss the moment of things getting really serious. Uh, and that's dangerous. And of course, it has implications for us, because a, a North Korean strike on Guam means a world war. Because for the second time, um, NATO would have to act uh, to, to, um, to uh, launch Article 5 in defense of an ally. Yes, please. Uh, the, uh, my question is, uh, um, what do you think of the pressure points uh, in uh, southern Europe? Italy coming with elections, uh, Spain sort of, well, <laughs> with a big problem in Catalonia, to put it mildly, and Greece still really not out of the, of the woods. Uh, well, Greece has just been uh, let out of the excess deficit uh, procedure, if, I, if I'm right. <laughs> and therefore, uh, you might argue that, uh, that it's um, at last being fixed. Um, there, is a, there are ingrained problems of uh, lack of competitiveness in the South, uh, mainly to do with uh, rigid labor markets. Uh, and, uh, and I'm afraid in Spain or in Italy, they haven't been fixed yet. Um. But neither have really in Greece. You had, I mean, you had reforms that were aimed at uh, just, just squeezing out revenue of, out of a really struggling private economy, but, but you didn't have a big push to make Greece's economy more competitive under Syriza. Well, successive Greek governments had the choice of either um, putting the uh, pain of reforms on the public sector or on the public. I'm afraid they chose to, 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 um, uh, to put it on the public. 
Greece um, is a country of a quarter of the population of Poland, has the same number of bureaucrats. <laughs> well, if that's your preference, you know, to keep all those people in useless jobs, then, then of course the, your population will suffer, but that's a political choice. Valerie Ruxel, formerly um, EU Commission official. Um, you mentioned that um, you, uh, in the aftermath of these elections, one of the important points was to restore fairness to capitalism. How would you go about doing that? And should that be done at the national, regional, or European level? What kind of initiatives would you, uh, would you suggest? I mean, we've, we've been living with this uh, 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 presumption that uh, uh, the economy is so global, national governments can't do much. I disagree. Um, and, uh, and multilateral efforts have led to naming the problem, but not really fixing it. I think a large part of the problem with capitalism is that nation states have been deprived of revenue. And nation states have been deprived of revenue to do things that command people's loyalty, uh, because the revenue has been seeping out uh, to tax havens uh, and to um, very sophisticated tax uh, uh, management uh, systems. But, it, but as nation states, we could fix it. There's nothing to stop the United States from passing a law forbidding American citizens holding accounts in, tax, in OECD designated tax havens, uh, or banning, indeed, uh, anonymous corporations. Um, we could start in the EU by saying that uh, any company uh, with shareholding in a, in, a, in a designated tax haven may not bid for uh, EU or, 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 or public procurement. And you could start cleaning it up uh, and restoring the, the revenue where it belongs. Uh, I mean, I, I understand that there are some marginal limit, uh, um, uh, uses of, um, uh, of uh, uh, these jurisdictions, but I think the pain and the, and the, the costs of them have, has just become too big. Uh, the British could fix their, their problem with London. You know, there are 36,000 houses in London alone whose ownership is not known. Well, you could pass a national law saying within six months everybody registers beneficial ownership. If not, uh, um, you pay 10% tax, six months after that, we confiscate it. What's to stop us? Thank you. Good morning. Is this working? Yes. I'm uh, Paul Tajak, a <coughs> visiting fellow here and a French diplomat as well. Um, you know, Poland and Hungary are somewhat drifting away from the center of gravity of uh, the EU and of European values. And as a consequence, Germany and to a lesser extent, France are faced with the dilemma as how to deal with that. Uh, essentially, you have maybe two or three options. Either you confront them or you ignore that and just do business as usual, or you ignore them and push forward with even more EU integration within the Eurozone. Um, France and Germany and, and the Commission for that matter have been struggling to find a, a path between these different options. What would be your advice? It's very difficult, as you say, because nationalist elite have this ability to mobilize their base against the pressure of, uh, from abroad. And we know this from uh, from North Korea, from Iran, from uh, Venezuela, from Cuba, you name it. And so, uh, so this pressure from outside um, doesn't always work and is sometimes counterproductive. Um, and particularly when it's ineffective. There's an Indian saying, I'm told, if you can't be a lion, don't be a mosquito. So if you are going to do something, it has to be something that, that they will take note of. Hrdek, I know you have to go uh, very shortly, but before you do go, uh, what do you think, 
will be the biggest problem facing Europe in, in, in two years' time. When we'll be writing the next edition of, of this publication, you know, two, three years from now. Well, I think migration is a problem that is with us. Uh, it's a generational uh, challenge. Radek, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Very nice to be back. Thanks so much. to the second part of this morning's program. Uh, and I'm really uh, delighted, frankly, to have this uh, well-developed panel, group of panelists here. This is a, an extraordinary amount of talent on the, on, the, on the dais. So I'm going to very briefly run through some biographical information. And then we're going to make our way through the panelists and let them sort of lay out what they think are some of the most important things for you all to understand about the pressure points faced by Europe, and then we're going to do some questions and answers. And that will probably, <laughs> and then we will turn to the audience for questions. Um, let me begin here um, with Federico Rejo, uh, who is a research officer at the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies, where he is responsible for all research on political parties and EU institutions. He also brings um, a wealth of knowledge to this panel uh, from his time working at the European Central Bank. I'm sure we'll put you through your paces on some of the related issues. Um, next, we have Dalibor Rohak, who is a research fellow here at AEI, um, where he studies European political and economic trends uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, the European Union, the Eurozone, and post-communist transitions. Uh, he's a, also concurrently a visiting fellow at the Max Beloff Center um, and a fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. One wonders how you have time to sleep, Dalibor. <laughs> um, next, we have Hannah Thoburn, a research fellow at the Hudson Institute, where she focuses on Russia, Ukraine, Eastern European politics, and the transatlantic relationship. She's also a member of the Advisory Council on the Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative, which I assume is about understanding it, not advancing it. Um, and uh, getting she's rid of it. Like, getting rid of it. Um, and before joining Hudson, she also uh, served at Brookings, um, the Foreign Policy Initiative, Yale, and also brave soul that she has spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. In Crimea. In Crimea. So, so there you go. <laughs> and finally, last but certainly not least, Desmond Lachman, who is also my colleague here at AEI. Uh, who joined, joined AEI after serving as a managing director and chief emerging market economic strategist at Solomon Smith Barney, uh, as well as serving as a deputy director at the IMF uh, in their office of policy development and, and the review department. Um, here at AEI, he focuses on global macroeconomy, global currency issues, and multilateral lending agencies. As I said, a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I think what we should do, um, Dalibor, since you are the fearless leader of this project, is to begin with you to sort of give us a framework for why we pursued this project and, and sort of the larger um, goals that you had. Indeed. Um, yeah, so it's been 30 minutes into the conversation and we haven't really said anything about, about the publication that we are launching. Uh, so so, so I, I should probably give you a little bit of background on this. Uh, when I joined AEI two and a half years ago, uh, I think it was quite obvious to, to me and, and my colleagues that Europe was not, not in a good state. So the Eurozone crisis was, was, was reaching its peak with the standoff between Greece and the Troika in the summer of 2015. The same summer, uh, the largest wave of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants hit Europe's shores uh, since, since, since uh, the Second World War. Uh, you had uh, European politics that were becoming more and more unpredictable uh, instead of center-left, center-right parties that basically agreed on, on the broad contours of democratic politics. You had anti-establishment groups arriving in power in places such as Greece, uh, Poland, 
and, 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 and Hungary had Russia with a very aggressive posture in Central and Eastern Europe, also funding political extremism. Um, and you also had a wave of terror attacks across Europe, some of them small, others big, but all of them very corrosive and, and uh, with, with very direct uh, political implications. So, so what we thought would be useful would be to look at these various crises and challenges in a way that uh, was interdisciplinary, if you will. Very often foreign policy wonks don't really look at the economics. Sometimes economists don't really look at uh, geopolitical or strategic implications of, 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 of the problems they're trying to, to address. So, so what we tried to do with, with this book was to show that uh, most, if not all, of Europe's crises and challenges are connected. Uh, there is solid evidence that shows that financial crises boost support for uh, far-right populism. Um, the Great Depression is an extreme example, but, but also just looking at the data going back to 1870, uh, the, the association is, 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 is very strong. It's also clear that the refugee crisis that hit Europe uh, was associated with a, with a uh, very dramatic destabilization of, of Europe's, Europe's politics. Russia played a role in all, the, all of that. The Russian intervention in Syria uh, displaced uh, hundreds of thousands of people within Syria, and that was done, uh, I think it's, it's not a stretch to say that it was done deliberately in order to, uh, to, to, to destabilize, uh, destabilize Europe. So in, in many ways, when we started embarking on this project, Europe really faced uh, a perfect storm of, 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 of many, different, uh, many different challenges. And, and many of those problems are still lingering, um, although we might not feel them as acutely today as, as, as last year or, or, or a year and a half ago. And, and I, I suppose the main message of, of this little publication is, is that Americans should care about Europe. Even in a world of America first, Europeans are the closest friends and allies uh, that, 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 that the United States uh, will have. And any administration, regardless of uh, party affiliation, should, should take that into consideration. So at, at a minimum, I think that should require uh, politicians on this side of the Atlantic uh, to, to refrain from expressing support to, say, political movements and candidates that are threatening to undo the fabric that ties Europe's countries uh, together. President Trump, um, on the campaign trail in particular, uh, improvised quite a bit and, 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 and said things that uh, I think were, were, were received quite uh, with exasperation in, in Europe. Uh, most significantly, I think it's important to uh, reinvigorate uh, the commitment on both sides of the Atlantic to the Transatlantic Alliance to uh, as, as the main vehicle for, for Europe's Europe security. I think the first nine months of this administration have been more reassuring than much of what we heard on the, on the, on, on, on the campaign trail. If, if there is one controversial idea we are putting forward with, with this publication, at least idea that, that might be controversial in conservative circles, it is the idea that, uh, that, that Federico and I, because we are the only ones really responsible for that part, of, of, of the book is, is that we argue that it is very much in America's interest that Europe completes uh, its federalist governance structure. Uh, most of Europe's problems, uh, whether it's the Eurozone crisis, whether it's the refugee crisis, have to do with the fact uh, that the institutional architecture of the EU is incomplete and in many ways uh, dysfunctional. So Radek, uh, invoke the example of migration. I think that's, that's a perfect example because you have in this country a Schengen area of passportless travel of sorts. Uh, but that passportless travel, you know, nobody checks your documents when you go from Virginia to Maryland, relies ultimately on the fact that you have a federal government protecting the outside border, uh, providing a common asylum policy. Europe for many years had an area of passportless travel that relied on countries that happened to be at Europe's border to secure that border and, 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 and deal with uh, inflows of irregular migrants or, 
or, or, or asylum seekers. And in 2015, uh, it has been demonstrated quite clearly that that was not sustainable. And we could go through, through many uh, different examples of, of, of the same sort of incomplete institutional architecture that, that characterizes the, the EU today. Um, and the argument is that in order for Europe to succeed, it will have to navigate through the reflexive centralism that exists to some extent in, in, in Brussels, uh, and also uh, the knee-jerk temptation of, of, of restoring national sovereignty that, uh, that is shared in, in certain uh, centre-right uh, conservative circles. And, and, and the principles that we propose really reflect, uh, reflect a, a classical liberal approach to federalism, which is not uh, the way federalism is used in, in, in Europe these days. Federalism in Europe is very often used as a shorthand for more power to Brussels. Classical liberal vision of federalism, that of the founding fathers of the United States, of de Tocqueville, of Hayek, of Linostrom, means that you actually are dividing power at different levels of government based on the character of public goods that, that these different levels of government are, are supposed to provide. And, and we believe that that's something that can help reinvigorate center-right thinking on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, can provide an antidote to, to rising nationalism and populism, and is ultimately the only way forward for the European project. Thank you, Dalbert. Desmond, why don't you go next and kind of give us the economic piece of this as a background. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, let me say that, to start right now, by saying that Europe is experiencing an economic recovery after a very disappointing economic performance over the last 10 years. There's now a recovery going on, and what that's doing is it's breeding a lot of complacency, in my view, that the Euro crisis is behind us. Uh, I don't share that view at all. I think it's only a matter of time before the Euro crisis comes back in full force. And the reason I say that uh, is because I look at places like Italy and Germany. You know, if I focus on the two important countries in Europe, Germany, of course, being the largest country in the Eurozone, economically speaking, uh, Italy being the third largest. If we've got a problem with Italy and Germany, uh, we've really got a problem with the European Union. So let me just list, uh, uh, I'd like to say five reasons, but I might forget them, so I'll say several reasons uh, what, what support my view. Uh, the first reason is that the Euro is basically a flawed concept. What they've done with the euro is they've linked a country that is known for high productivity growth with a country that is known for being incapable of improving. You know, so we've got Germany together with Italy. What that means is that over the last 10 years or so, Italy has managed to lose competitiveness to Germany to the tune of 30%. There's absolutely no reason to think that this is going to change going forward, given the political developments that are occurring in Italy. So that's one of the basic flaws of the euro. The second basic flaw, of course, is that if Italy or any country in the periphery has to do fiscal adjustment to get its house back in order, it no longer has monetary policy as an offset. So this explains why these countries uh, do uh, rather have done rather poorly uh, over the past years. So my view is that the euro is uh, flawed. It's just a matter of time before this comes through. The second reason uh, that I've got concern is divergent economic performance. Uh, it's related in large part to this difference in competitiveness. So if we look, for instance, over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, Italy, you know, of course, if we go further back, Italy's per capita income today is below where it was in 1999 at the start of the euro, which isn't too good news. But what, again, we see is in relation to Germany, they've lost something like 20% in terms of per capita income. Germany's is going up, theirs is stagnant. Uh, that, I don't think, is a sustainable uh, proposition. 
Uh, of course, unemployment, the same sort of thing. Italy uh, maintains unemployment very high, uh, youth unemployment uh, high. Germany is now <coughs> saying this is not to hold these in a single monetary union doesn't strike me from an economic point of view as feasible. Then we've got the problem with uh, populism uh, at a political level. You know, they've spoken about uh, Germany, you know, the notion that you're now going to get a uh, Europe that is more integrated, you're going to have more Europe, there's going to be a banking union, a fiscal union, forget about it. With the uh, Federal uh, Democratic Party in this coalition, none of that uh, is going to happen. So you really can't buttress something that is flawed uh, through greater integration. That's not going to happen going forward. So that leaves it exposed. The fourth reason uh, I'm uh, not too optimistic about Europe is when you look at the basic vulnerabilities, what was the basic vulnerability? That there was too much public debt in relation to GDP. You know, that was really what triggered the crisis in 2010, big budget deficits, large public debt. Well, you look where we are right now, uh, public debt levels in many of these countries is higher than it was in uh, 2010 in relation to GDP. You know, I'm looking at Italy again, 135% of uh, GDP. That's not too good. And the second vulnerability is very weak banks. You know, so if you've got banks, you know, once again, let's look at Italy, 15% of their loans are non-performing. The banks are holding something like 10, 15% of their portfolio is Italian government bonds. This isn't a uh, very uh, healthy situation. The last reason uh, that uh, I'm uh, not very optimistic about Europe is how has this all been held together? This whole exercise, which looked like it was coming apart in 2012, has been saved by the ECB. That the ECB, you know, first with its over, uh, uh, outright monetary transaction mechanism, and then through its purchases of government bonds, you know, the ECB is buying a mere 60 billion uh, euros of bonds a month, you know, that a pity it shouldn't uh, hold together. So what I'm thinking is that the European economic recovery, to a large degree, owes to very ultra easy monetary policy by the ECB that has kept interest rates at ridiculously low levels and has kept the euro very weak until very recently. This is now changing. The euro has now appreciated by 15% over the last month. You know, so I'm thinking that if the euro was the main factor behind the European rec economic recovery and we've had a 15% appreciation of the euro recently, I don't expect this recovery to be uh, too long lived. The issue is, of course, one of timing. When does all of this uh, begin to unravel? You know, I would suggest that when we shift monetary policy, not just in Europe, but globally, when we nor begin normalizing interest rates, uh, these flaws will come out, and of course, another way that these flaws can come out earlier, uh, uh, sooner, uh, but I wouldn't venture as to wanting to time precisely when we're going to have the next Euro crisis, but it doesn't look to me too good uh, when you've got an Italian election uh, coming up in probably six months' time uh, that is likely to produce an inconclusive result You know that will really bring home to people uh, that... Uh, the prospect of Italy reforming and suddenly becoming a high productivity performer uh, is um, is really not going to materialize. You know, markets will change. Uh, you know, so I think you know from the United States point of view, you know, it's of great concern. You know, if Europe uh, unravels, uh, we'd be making a mistake to think that uh, the euro crisis is behind us. Thank you very much, um, Hannah. Would you be able to go uh, to take the next phase of this and talk to us a little bit about Russia and the challenges it presents, its connections to populism, I mean, also just the challenge it presents when it comes to issues like Ukraine and the sort of wider European effort, and really anything else you wanted to start with? Yeah, so first I just wanted to thank Golubor for putting this panel together, thank AEI uh, for, for having me here on this panel. And you know, I'm really glad that you titled the, this report pressure points, Europe's pressure points, because I think that's exactly actually how Russia looks at these things. I, I would include China in that as well. 
But when you take the sort of totality of all of these problems, really, that Europe has, if you're looking at it from a Russian point of view, they are pressure points. They're a very easy way to push. They, they see a weak point, and there is the opportunity on migration, on a weak economy, on populism. That's where it's suddenly now increasingly easy, I think, for the Russians, Chinese, and others who, who want to see a more weakened Europe start to push. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that that's precisely how you phrased um, the title of this. And I think that's actually one important reason why the United States should care about all of these problems in Europe. I think we've taken for granted for so long um, having Europe as a partner. And we've started to really just not pay attention. We think that the problems that Europe has are things that will go away. They'll fix them on their own. And we don't necessarily um, see them as being as significant as I think they really are because they offer such an opportunity for countries like Russia and China to start to weaken the European Union, start to weaken European unity, and start to weaken the transatlantic alliance. And when we look at it through that perspective, these things really do matter to the United States. They may seem to be you know, internal problems between Germany and Italy, uh, but they do, at the end of the day, matter to the kind of world order that I think the United States has valued in the past, and I hope continues to value. These are the, the sorts of things that we're starting to wrestle with in the United States, and what should our foreign policy be? But a strong Europe does, I think, matter to the United States. It should continue to matter. And, and when you look at Russia in particular, the kind of challenges that it poses to Europe and then in turn to the United States, very much do push on the issues that this report brings up. But they also have started to, I think, call into question some of the things that Europe has, we'll say, taken for granted. What is Europe? What are the values that Europe has? And I think these are the things that Russia, and it, it, it values a weakened Europe. It looks at Europe as a kind of rival empire in a way. Um, what does Europe stand for? And I think that's a question that Europe ne hasn't necessarily answered. And I think you see Russia taking advantage of that. And so you have, in a strange way, a situation where Russia is both an internal question for Europe as well as an external question. Russia is increasingly defining itself against the West, against Europe and the US and the transatlantic relationship. And that, in turn, means that you need Europe to have a definition of itself. And it doesn't necessarily have that. Working on it, it's getting there. But I don't think it's quite there yet. And so that's an internal question that I think Europe needs to really take care of. The external question. How can Europe defend itself? Will Europe defend itself? What does European defense really mean? Is Ukraine European? What is a European country? How will Russia respond, or how will Europe respond to Russian aggression, both small and large? Small in the sort of softer hacking electoral. Um, infiltration sense and harder in a stronger, more militaristic sense. We saw the sort of um, anxiety that was recently produced about the Zapad exercises taking place in Belarus, Kaliningrad, and that has raised a lot of questions about whether or not Europe can actually defend itself. So, you know, I think these questions for Europe it doesn't seem to me as though Europe's necessarily ready to answer them for itself yet. And I think part of that is tied up in the fact that Poland, which should have been and could have been and could still be the big power 
on the eastern side of Europe that can start to answer these questions about what, how Europe defines itself against the rest of the world and what Europe's position should be on defending itself against Russian um, aggression, small and large, Poland's not really there on these questions right now. It has its own problems, and it has its own problems um, with the European Union. And because I think of that Polish weakness, and because of pressure that Russia is putting on uh, the Germans, on the French, on a lot of these other countries, that discussion isn't really happening. So it, it, it's a situation that I think I, as an American observer, am very concerned about. You don't want to have a European partner that is distracted, but that is, to me, the fact of the matter. There are all of these problems, the migration issue, the, the economic issue, uh, the digital issue that Europe is consumed with. And yes, those things do need to be solved. But when you're considering all of the pressure from the outside, Russia and China in particular, um, and I think China's influence in Europe is, uh, is, is really greatly underestimated, Europe has a lot of work to do. I'll stop there. Plenty to think about, for sure. So last but not least. OK. So well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Talibor, for putting together the panel and having me here. Uh, when we exchanged emails on what I should cover, Dalibor basically gave me five minutes to solve all the problems of Europe. Uh, I think I will take seven or eight minutes and probably solve none of them, as always <laughs> in, this, in these occasions. <laughs> but, those uh, Italians. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just maybe, he has introduced our contribution to the publication very nicely already. I will just share with you the key insight and some uh, thoughts that may be useful to, to frame it a bit. The key insight, as he has uh, said very, very nicely, is that it is the mode of integration that we have chosen, the neo-functionalist mode of integration that Europe has been pursuing, that is giving us a bureaucratically centralized confederation in Europe. Uh, in, instead, a, a clear, well-structured, I think, federal or confederal, at least, blueprint, in many ways would allow us to have a better functioning polity and potentially to repatriate many powers and to eliminate a lot of the intrusiveness that is now blamed by many populists on uh, the European Union. And uh, um, uh, in a way, it's also partly the, 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 the piece that we have written is partly polemical against uh, part of the traditional rhetoric of uh, Europhiles in, in Brussels, people like, I don't know, Gifer Hofstadt, who um, usually label themselves a European federalist, but as Dalibor said, we, we are telling them actually the mode and way of integration that you have pursued and that you privilege actually is, is actually incompatible with the real federalization in Europe. And we advocate a, 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 a blueprint that we believe is more authentically federalist. Um, uh, in my own work on this matter, I tap very heavily on uh, uh, insights developed by Vincent Ostrom, the great American uh, political scientist, and he wrote a wonderful book in the 1990s called The Meaning of American Federalism, because of course all these notions were developed first in the United States, which is the, the fatherland of federalism, and it defines federalism as a system of government in which sovereignty and power is distributed among autonomous uh, units of government, autonomous units of government. The key insight, I think, is precisely that adjective, autonomous. It, it conveys the meaning that in a real federation, there is no hierarchical relationship between the federal government and the other governments. Each government is supreme in its own autonomous sphere of competence. And this has very important consequences for the, the political economy, I would say, of a federal polity, because it triggers competitive dynamics among the different units of government, which tend to hold each other in check. They tend to limit each other's uh, possibility to intervene, to regulate the economy, to control society. And, and this is the insight, I think, that Dalibor was hinting at when he said that a sort of classical liberal uh, federalism, but I think there is no other liberalism. Liberalism is an inherently classical liberal uh, political form, precisely because of this uh, inbuilt virtue that it is able to, uh, to hold government uh, in check. Uh, the other, I think, insight that is important to keep in mind in order to understand what somehow went wrong in Europe uh, is the fact that usually in, in, in the process of federalization consists in um, 
a convention in which the, the federated states decide to transfer to the federal level a limited, very limited number of powers, of, of functions, uh, enumerated usually in a constitution, and they strictly reserve all the rest to themselves and to the lower levels of governance. This is very important because, of course, they know that the autonomy of the federalist logic will mean that the federal government will um, uh, uh, fully control this field. So they have an interest in minimizing what they are transferring to the, to the federal level. Now we move to the, to the way European integration has advanced. Uh, and uh, Euro the logic of European integration, I, I think, is um, a logic of uh, uh, sharing sovereignty in an ever-growing number of policy fields based on a neo-functionalist uh, dynamic. Uh, th th there is the idea that you start sharing sovereignty in one field, then uh, there are spillovers that are produced into other fields, and then you have an incentive to share sovereignty in a, in a second field. Then you have spillovers produced in a third field, and this gives you the incentive to share sovereignty in a third field. So it's an open-ended process, uh, which potentially, again, it's open-ended. I mean, there is no limit to the number of fields in which you can potentially share sovereignty. This is the, the first uh, feature of it. And the second feature of it is that uh, contrary to federalism, which tends to produce competitive dynamics among the different units of government, this sort of neo-functionalist integration tends to produce collusive tendencies among governments, because you share um, government power at the European level within common institutions, but you are not federalizing, you're not transferring limited competencies to the federal level, jealously guiding all the rest uh, to, uh, to yourself. And the result of this is evident for everyone to see. Uh, Europe is progressively becoming a bureaucratically centralized confederation in which many things that are normally in a federation dealt with at the federal level, such as defense or foreign policy, are completely out of reach for the, for the European level. And uh, uh, instead, the confederation that does intrude in many fields which normally have nothing to do with federal competence, the minute regulation of economic life, uh, now, for example, a form of co-management of national economies by the European Commission after the crisis. Just imagine the, the federal government in uh, Washington inspecting the preliminary budget of the state of Delaware or California and telling the, the state of Delaware or California to modify this or that law. This is actually a fundamental breach of the principle of federalism, right? The, the separation of the different levels of, of governance. But in Europe, this is exactly what happens. 70, uh, over 70% of the EU budget goes into common agricultural policy and cohesion policy, which, which are tasks which have nothing to do with the properly structured uh, federation. So you see what I'm getting at. It's, a, it's an upside down uh, confederation which has been overly intrusive and, and, and um, uh, it has displayed the tendencies for uh, regulation, for harmonization in many fields. But this has nothing to do with the proper federalist uh, blueprint. And that's why with Dalibor we, we propose let's, let's refocus the limited energies and resources of European integration on the core uh, federal task, defense, foreign policy, border control, the, the four freedoms of the single market and the euro, and let's openly accept that we should not fear renationalization, repatriation of powers, um, uh, decentralization in all other fields. Let's try to restructure the union along more federal or, or confederal line. Uh, therefore, I agree with what Radek said about uh, the, the, the key problem of, of the union, that it's, it's a bureaucratic confederation at the, at the moment. Maybe the one last uh, thought, I guess we can discuss the details of this blueprint because as I said, I have been given five minutes. Um, uh, uh, one last thought specifically uh, addressed to American conservatives. I hear a lot, I am having a lot of meetings this week in, in Washington, and I think that it's dangerously widespread in American conservative circles a certain dismissive tendency towards the European project and the European Union. And I, I can tell you very frankly, it's highly misguided. It's highly misguided and it goes against the best interest of, of the United States, for two reasons at least. The first reason is that when you look at the at the sort of political space, the geographical and political space that Europe represents, there is no way to stably organize that space if not within some form of supranational union. Now, I think that the only viable supranational union is along the lines that we are advocating, a very minimalist federation or confederation dealing with very limited tasks where there is an incentive in sites and, and unity and decentralizing all the rest. Uh, but there is no way that a Europe of autonomous nation states could 
could possibly work. It is going to be in a disarray, it is going to be weak, and this is not in the interest of the United States. The interest of the United States is to have a strong, stable, prosperous Europe that can project power and stabilize also its neighborhood within the transatlantic alliance. And uh, it, it saddens me a lot to see that these ideas are widespread in conservative circles. Th these people are usually the ones who understand American federalism best. It is the idea that you need to keep as much power as possible at the, at the, at the national level. Um, the second point is even more, more obvious, and I quote here um, Schwarzenberg, a former Czech um, uh, foreign minister, who used to say, in, in Europe, in, in the current setup of Europe, less Brussels automatically mean more Moscow. And I don't think I, I, I joined my friend on the panel here. I don't think I had to explain to US people why this is not in the best interest of the United States. So let's not play with fire. Let's try to stabilize, to restructure this union together. But the, the, a certain tendency that I have seen in the current administration to flirt with populist forces, with anti-European forces, is, um, is, in my opinion, very dangerous, and we should avoid it. I'll stop here. OK, excellent. Um, so we haven't a lot of time. So I think I'm going to unfairly ask you, guys, you all uh, sort of a, a, a big question. Um, so, you know, not too long ago, uh, the president of France uh, in a, made a speech, I think it was in Athens, and he, and he said, you know, the Europeans have sort of lost their ambition, uh, and that if they don't take action, that they, there's a risk of a sort of slow disintegration. Um, and, and yet, a, a number of the, the, the points that were made this morning were about sort of a certain level of complacency that might be setting in in certain mm -hmm. sectors. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, Desmond, for example, you've pointed to some, what, you, what I think you think are some fatal flaws that are sort of wait, lurking out there. And arguably in uh, immigration, it's only a question of whether or not there's another wave that this will be, that, that the, the Europeans will be tested again. But, you know, so, so can the Europeans sort of just bump along as they have, rather than think about these big questions of reorganizing? Um, or, if that really isn't a smart answer, what is it that gives impetus to such a massive undertaking? I mean, you're talking about fundamentally restructuring the, the economic infrastructure of Europe. Mm. You're talking about sort of reposturing and thinking about the, def the f defense and how they think about Russia and the other threats. You've, you've mentioned immigration and other issues, and you are really talking about, well, we're going to evolve this, this entire sort of vision for this, for this European project. So what gives impetus to that? I mean, does it take a crisis? Does sort of, has complacency already set in and you've sort of, maybe we've missed a moment? Or is there an economic crisis that will drive a rethink? Because this is, you're asking for a lot of energy and leadership at a time when things are politically challenging. So what's, we can just sort of go down the line or you guys can jump in as you wish, but I'm interested in what you think is the, is the change agent here. Yeah. The problem as I see it, um, you know, is really very serious uh, in that Europe, what they've done, should I say at least the Eurozone, is they've adopted a single currency that has led to very poor economic performance. Now, ideally, what you'd want is you'd want a Europe, you know, that you've got the European Union could be good in very many other ways. You wouldn't want to give up the single market and all the rest, uh, but you'd want to get to a currency arrangement that was more suitable uh, to the countries uh, that currently share the euro. The problem is that it's difficult to get from here to there without causing a major crisis. So what I mean is the moment that the euro is abandoned, uh, we'd have widespread default uh, on sovereign debt. You'd have a huge banking crisis because, for instance, the Italians, there's no way that they can service their debt at a different, at a very much higher interest rate than it is here. So we'd have a default on two and a half trillion dollars of debt. This is like a nuclear bomb going off in the middle right. of Europe, and that explains why there's a great reluctance to even think about changing this exchange arrangement. So I'm afraid that they stuck, uh, you know, that what they're going to do is they're going to keep trying to hold this thing together, even though. Uh, it makes very little economic sense, 
And what that means is Europe is likely to have very poor perf economic performance you know, for a, uh, a prolonged period. So I don't see an easy solution. I mean, of the So is there an incremental solution? I mean, is there a... No, is there a because as soon as you touch it, as soon as you give any notion uh, that uh, uh, this arrangement changes, uh, you'd get runs on banks and you'd get debt defaults and so on. I mean, the idea, the idea theoretically what would make a lot of sense would be for Germany to get out of the euro, you know, for Germany to adopt its own currency. That would address the imbalances. But I fear that as soon as you make the slightest change in this arrangement, the whole thing unravels. And that explains, you know, why uh, there was such reluctance uh, to kick Greece out of this arrangement, you know, because you worried about uh, the contagion, how much more so, you know, if you're dealing with uh, an important country uh, like Italy? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question you ask, what could be the impetus for serious change? Because, you know, from, a, from an American perspective, if you sit here and look at the past 10 years of European bureaucratic history, there's any number of crises that should have sent Europe into a point where it would have started to make these changes. There is the Euro crisis, the refugee situation, what happened in Ukraine. Any number of these things could have, should have started the wheels turning. So I don't, I, I, I don't know that there is a good answer, but I fear that the answer is it will only happen when there is no other choice. You know, and I'm very glad to see President Macron in France trying to start these conversations. I think it's a great thing to start the conversations, but it, there doesn't seem to be much appetite for what he's attempting to say. And he may not be going about it the right way. It's a difficult thing to try and sell one man's vision, France's vision, to the other 27. Um, but something does need to be done, but I fear that we're going to end up in a point where it, it, that, that decision's only made when, there, when, when, when that's the last option. And that's a point that I think is very dangerous for Europe. And that's where you end up with a, a Russia that knows that it really can start to work and infiltrate into each of these members, a Russia that knows that it has a little bit more power when it's compared to the, the whole of the combined Europe. It's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. I do think it's going to just bump along. Yeah. Um, and it, I'll be interested to hear from, from our European colleagues how they see it, because I, I wonder if this is only an American feeling that Europe is not confronting its problems. Of course, we as Americans have our own problems. Certainly, Europe is working on, on certain issues. Um, and I think right now actually seems much stronger than it did a year ago. But I do worry that just as, as Desmond said, there are some things lurking there under the surface that in a very short amount of time really could emerge again and send Europe again into the kind of spiral that we saw in 2008-2009. Delabore, as you answer this, I, I actually, from my perspective, kind of, I know that some of the monograph dealt with uh, the issue of migration, which I think is a really mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. acute issue, um, and offered some practical thinking about <laughs> steps that could be taken there. I wonder, sort of as you respond to my larger question, if you have thoughts on whether or not certain areas are ripe for action in a way that maybe the economic infrastructure isn't because of the complexity of unraveling it. I, I, I'll, I'll get back to, to, to migration because that's an, that's an important subject and, and we do try to offer some answers in that area. Uh, but first of all, I have to say that it's a great joy to work at AEI because uh, you don't have to agree with your colleagues and, uh, and, and, and you have complete academic freedom to, to say whatever you, you think. So, so on panels featuring AEI scholars, you typically have people who disagree with, with each other. And, and I actually think that, that Desmond tends to overrate the role played by the common European currency in uh, bringing about 
uh, the problems that Europe is facing. I mean, I, I do believe that uh, forcing German-style monetary policy on a very diverse continent in the aftermath of a financial shock of 2008 uh, was not a good thing for the economic performance of, 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 of the periphery. But I also think that uh, countries such as Greece, Italy and Spain would not have been economic powerhouses if they had kept their, uh, their own currencies. And, and, and so the structural problems, I think, are, are what's driving uh, the disappointing economic performance for the most part in, 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 in that part of Europe. And, and also, the, that I, I believe that it's not always helpful to um, to focus on the monetary side of of of, 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 of the of the currency union uh, only because uh, what what really is making the eurozone crisis so difficult to to, to solve are institutional problems questions of uh, fiscal governance uh, questions of how do you resolve situations in which governments become uh, illiquid or insolvent, sort of diverging expectations that that that, that governments have, um, and 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 so I don't think that there is a uh, there that there is a sort of technocratic monetary fix to to, to any of this, even if we sort of assume the way uh, all the politics. Now, segueing to to, to the broader question of uh, of changing Europe and what can what can give an impetus to that. Um, I uh, watched yesterday President Macron's speech at the, at the Sorbonne, which I think was, was good on questions of common European values and, 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 and this drive away actually from, from the purely technocratic uh, approach that has been driving European integration for, for a long time. I, th I think Radek said it uh, and we sort of echoed it on this panel that, that Europe needs to get at some level more political because of the questions is going to tackle uh, our political. At the same time, I, I thought that Macron really avoided all the hard questions. So there are real, uh, I mean, really difficult issues that, that will have to be sort of hammered out in, in, in any sort of Franco-German bargain over the governance of the Eurozone. And I don't see the two countries getting uh, any closer on, uh, on really I mean, the question of fiscal governance and whether you are going to have a common European insurance mechanism against financial shocks, or whether you can have uh, a redistributive union. Uh, I, I, I think on those things, uh, th there is no clear, clear way uh, forward. And, and, and the third, perhaps most disappointing thing about uh, the speech is, is, is the traditional French dirigiste top-down, and also economically nationalist approach to things. So, so, so Macron is to some extent all about Europe that protects against, I suppose, foreign competition, uh, against uh, disruptive um, economic change. And I don't think that's the right way for Europe. And, and when uh, certain situations emerge, like Italians taking over a shipyard in France, uh, suddenly all the commitment to European values and single market goes out of the window. And and there's this sort of ruthless pursuit of, 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 of French national interest. Uh, now going back to, to migration, I think migration is, is a really interesting example because it, uh, it, 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 it sort of carries in itself all the problems that we associate with the European project. So, so you have this structure of you know, passportless travel in the Schengen area, uh, which is not matched by uh, a common border protection and asylum policy. And, and that was at the heart of this problem in 2015. We sort of said, oh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, thousands of people arriving in Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Greece, you know, let those countries deal with that problem. And, and according to the Dublin regulation, you s supposedly should be leaving those countries deal with the problem. But, but it clearly was not sustainable. The whole thing unraveled. And, and so, so the question now is, how do you build a common European uh, border protection and asylum system, uh, because this is really a collective action problem for European countries. And, and you had a bunch of Central European countries that said, uh, yeah, we like Schengen, but we are not going to do anything. So we are not going to take in any refugees. Uh, we are not really that willing to spend money on, 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 on any of those things either. And, 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 and so 
so, so, so getting out of that problem is not easy. What we propose in, 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 in that chapter that deals with, with the refugee crisis is, uh, is an idea from, from economics, uh, from, from economic theory uh, known as, uh, as, as matching markets uh, met, uh, or mechanism design, if you will. You can create an algorithm uh, that would uh, essentially have a centralized system for uh, associate or ma matching refugees or asylum seekers and member countries in, in, in the European Union in a way uh, that would give choice to asylum seekers to apply for asylum in a country of their choice uh, and would also give governments uh, not just a feeling of, of being in control but, a, but a effectively a, a degree of leeway that they don't have under the proposals that have been coming from the European Commission where they try to give quotas to individual European countries where you would say, oh, you know, you take this many refugees, you don't really have a say of, over who those people are. You can, you can, you can, you can sort of get away from, 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 from that by essentially respecting the choices made by refugees and, and also uh, giving more, uh, more control over the process to, to the government. It's been done on a national level, so in the UK uh, there are efforts to use uh, mechanism designed to to match uh, refugees and uh, local uh, jurisdictions, uh, towns, cities, etc. Uh, hasn't been done on the European level, and and, and we believe my my authors, uh, Will Jones, who is a political scientist in London, and and Alex Teitelboim, who is a uh, is an economist at Oxford, uh, that this would be a way uh, to 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 get out of this uh, really dead end. That, that the Europeans haven't solved since 2015. Well, and you know, and I think in 2009 and 10, I was in Greece because I was working for the U.S. Coast Guard doing international affairs, and I remember getting a brief by the Greek uh, Coast Guard. And they, at, at that time, they had between 100,000 and 150,000 migrants crossing their waters on an annual basis. So, even absent the crisis of the last few years, the reality is that that was an astronomical amount of humans to, to rescue, to support, to sustain, to find onward places for. And, and, and at the time it was a struggle for them because the posture of the EU was if you document and you're, you're the first arrival point, then, then it falls to you. So in fact, even before there was a crisis, although we would consider that many migrants a migration crisis, even before there was the acute crisis of the last few years, in fact, there was a huge problem, at least for the border countries. So it's, it, 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 it's, and it's also the same Greece that lost one third of its GDP since 2008. Mm -hmm. Right, so I mean, it, right. Um, so let's let you finish and then we'll take a few minutes for questions from the audience. Okay, so I'll, I'll no try pressure, to be, but again, to solve I'll try everything. To be, to be brief <laughs> anyway, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Dalibor on the issue, not, not by chance he's my co author, so I, I, don't need to, I don't need to add a lot. But on, on the Euro, I mean, you know that your, your view is quite, quite of a fridge view. In, uh, I know it's quite mainstream in, uh, in American economic circles, but in, in Europe it's quite of a fringe view. I would say that there is a mainstream view which has uh, evolved. The, the mainstream view a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, was that the euro is a currency without a state. And in order to fix the euro, we need to transform the European Union into more of a sort of state currency with, with fiscal transfers, etc. Uh, the view has evolved mostly because of the ECB monetary policy, which has somehow eased the, the, the pressure and the, the, the crisis. Uh, and now the view is that oh, uh, there are some fixes that we need to complete but uh, we have a new, new rules on microeconomic governance. I don't share that mainstream view, I will say it later. We have new rules on microeconomic governance. Uh, we, have, uh, we have adopted the embryo of the banking union. So that, that in, in commission circles, for example, I feel that um, the priority now is completely the banking union, uh, much more than envisaging grand plans on, on fiscal integration. My own view is that the, the two cardinal virtues of the, of the common currency are, first of all, the fiscal straitjacket that it imposes on uh, profligate governments. This is an issue that is often missed. I mean, my own country, Italy, uh, went uh, past this time, uh, you know, uh, pursuing competitive devaluations, you know, it, uh, better than, than me in the 1970s and 1980s, without tackling the, the, the real structural problems of the economy. So with the euro, this is, this is gone. Uh, we had a very good window of opportunity in the first decade of the euro to reform because of lower 
uh, interest rates. So we, my, my, my own view is that we should says the healthy straight jacket that the, U, the euro represent to uh, re restructure, thoroughly restructure the European uh, economic and social model in a direction that is more flexible, more competitive, and that, so we, we will kill two bears with one stone. We will stabilize the common currency through market-based adjustment mechanism, and we would also somehow prepare the ground for rekindling European growth. But again, it's a complex issue, so I, I don't have time to elaborate much on it. On the crisis, I think you, any political science textbook tells you that you need three things. You need ideas, you need an opportunity, and you need leadership for change to happen. So the ideas, we are a bit working on it, and I think one of the problems... Yes, well done. <laughs> uh, one of the problems in the early phase of the crisis is that the right ideas were not in, in place. I mean, we were somehow caught off, off guard at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, the crisis usually provides the opportunity. It looks at the, you, we can look at the United States. I mean, the, the, the opportunity for the Articles of Confederation was the War of Independence. The opportunity for the Constitution was the quasi-collapse of the, of the federal government and 10 years uh, uh, later, or the confederal government ten, 10 years later. So a crisis often provides uh, the opportunity, so the next crisis, if the right ideas are in place, we, we may have a chance, and then you need leadership, you know, and this is a bit uh, missing at the moment in the European countries, because even the most responsible leaders, like Merkel, tend to be overly cautious at times and do not like to take uh, risk and to bet. Macron is a bit different, uh, but again, I have my own doubts that this blueprint for Europe is, uh, is uh, the right one, and I would join Dalibor's uh, doubts in this regard. But, uh, but let's take some questions. I yes, don't want to, uh, of course. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. And a, let's start here. I'm going to make it the hardest possible place for you to get to with the microphone. <laughs> here. Um, hi there, um, I'm Andre Arpes. I would have a question for Mr. Uh, Lackman. Um, you don't strike me as a fan of the euro, and you say that you don't have confidence in Europe, you know, partly because of the currency. And you brought up an issue of uh, what happened to competitiveness between Germany and Italy over the past 30 years. So my question to you would be, um, what do you suppose happened to competitiveness of, say, Arkansas vis-a-vis -vis California over the past 30 years? And so do you wake up at night worried about the future of the dollar? Or do you think that perhaps it has more to do with the incompleteness of the structure of the euro, as opposed to the idea of having a excellent cur currency as such? Thank yeah. you. Uh, I don't wake up at night worrying about Arkansas and Alabama and so on, because the United States is what's called an optimum currency area that there's a lot of mobility of labor, there's a lot of flexibility of wages, that there are fiscal transfers that occur, Europe isn't an optimum currency area. So when you get stresses in places like Greece and Ireland and so on, you don't get mass migration of the populations to other areas. Rather, what you get is you get economic blight and you get very high uh, rates of unemployment. So in that sense, the euro isn't an appropriate currency uh, area that didn't satisfy the conditions for an optimum currency area. So the least you would have wanted is you would have wanted countries that were similar in structure or similar in outlooks uh, to be unified. The fact that you've got a country like Italy together with Germany causes uh, these tensions. And I'm not sure that I share the view that uh, the conventional view now is that the euro is such a great thing, you know, because otherwise we wouldn't have people like Silvio Berlusconi uh, suggesting that we introduce a parallel currency. We wouldn't have people like Beppo Grillo suggesting that the euro is uh, somewhat of a disaster, you know, that in fact most of the Italian opposition parties, other than uh, the ruling government, uh, aren't too enthusiastic about the euro because they see that between 1999 and uh, 2017, Italy's uh, economic performance has been disastrous, uh, which you wouldn't say characterized the whole of the post-war period when they had currency flexibility uh, to make the kind of adjustments. So, you know, you've really got to look at what the performance was pre-euro and post-euro uh, to have great doubts about it as uh, a recipe for prosperity for Southern Europe. All right, so who's next? 
Um, back here in the back. Thank you. Um, David Marti from the government of Catalonia's delegation here in DC. Uh, I have a question about um, your family's uh, view for, for the European Union. Um, there's a lot of internal diversity among how member states are organized. So we have the German Lender, we have uh, the Belgian regions, of course we have like regions like Catalonia as well. And the debate of independence that we're having is mostly about where power lies and how it is divided. So I was wondering, um, in your federal view for Europe, what role, if any, do you think like these sort of strong regions uh, could play? Well, it's a good question. You know, there is a long tradition, actually, of federalism that is a regionalist federalism. Actually, the, 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 the regionalist group in the European Parliament is, tends to be quite federalist in outlook. My impression is that it's not realistic to advocate any form of federalism that would, uh, it's not politically realistic to imagine to split up nation states and create sort of European Union, you know, that would directly relate to regions. So that the main building block of any form of federal or confederal order in Europe will remain, has to remain inevitably, uh, the, the, the nation state as we have built it. Uh, you are not going to build any form of viable European order against the nation states, as you did not, you could not build any viable American federation or confederation against the, the 13 colonies, you know? So they had to agree. There was a lengthy process of ratification of the constitution. I mean, we're all, we all familiar with this. So uh, this is a, a basic political constraint that you need to accept, I think. Uh, the future of Catalonia or of Scotland, of course, uh, will, will depend on the, the, the political bargain or the development in, in these two countries. Uh, you know what the answer is that it, it's, it is usually given. I mean, first of all, your process uh, is uh, legally contested. Uh, if you become independent, you would have to reapply for membership of the European Union, as uh, Catalonia would. Uh, it would not change, I think, the dynamic of a federalization process in Europe, because it would just be that we would have now a Catalonian nation state um, that is sitting around the table on, a, on an equal footing with the other nation states. But I would not necessarily, I mean, I, I, I know this from the Italian experience. I think it is the situation, my own view of the matter is that the situation is, is, has got a bit out of control. I think it would have been um, also because of the Partido Popular uh, problems and, and lack of strategic awareness. I think they should have been able to concede at an earlier stage a real federalization of Spain to diffuse you know, secessionist tendencies, but we are now at a, at a very advanced stage of, of confrontation. If I can briefly, I know that I mean, the add on, on, on the euro. Don't, don't take Berlusconi's <laughs> proposal very seriously. Uh, uh, he, when, when he was in power in the first, de actually, this first decade of missed reforms is largely his responsibility. And I, I am speaking, I mean, I mean I am kind of representing the EPP here, so, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, the other thing is that most of the population, you are right that there is a certain detachment from, from the, the, the programs in peripheral countries, but if you look at the, at the case of France, it, it was a very striking case of a candidate, Marine Le Pen, which was openly running on an anti-Euro platform, and she lost the election. We have a French diplomat here who can, I think, confirm that. She partly lost the election because her plans on, on, on currency seemed completely out of tune with the will of the French people and, and any sort of uh, rational economic blueprint. Or, or even to take, if I, if I may suggest, <laughs> an even more extreme example is, 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 is Greece. So, so in 2015, Greece was not that far from, from actually giving up on the whole thing. But it was, I mean, it was the popular pressure, ultimately, that, that tied Syriza's hands. Uh, I mean, Greeks, when you ask them, they want their country to be part of the Eurozone by, by I think, very wide margins, because they see it not just as a matter of technical currency arrangement, but they, 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 they see it yeah, well, uh, through geopolitical lenses. Yeah, so that would, I, uh, that would be a cause for pessimism, you know, if they're going to stick with a currency arrangement that doesn't work, uh, the performance, there's no reason to expect the economic performance to be any better than it has been the last 10 years. And all you've got to do is you, you've got to just contrast the performance of Europe as a whole against that of the United States in terms of the economic crisis. The United States is now something like 10 percentage points above its previous peak. Europe is just regaining its previous peak. And places like Italy uh, are still something like 5 or 6% below they were 
uh, GDP in terms of where it was in 2008. You know, this is a rather, at least I would have thought, uh, this is a cause for real concern, you know, that Europe is going to remain sclerotic and driven by uh, divergence. So I think that we are a little past time and that we will leave it with Desmond having the last word. <laughs> but it was um, way too bleak, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will say that this is our tradition at AEI, which is we don't mind when people disagree um, because there are different perspectives on things. And uh, I think we all learned something from the debate. Dalibor is plugging his, 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 the report he's led on. One last time, thank you for coming. Uh, we very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.